as uh, expected. As as you know, I've been I've been saying that uh, cumulatively over the next three four years, we're going to have a twenty percent increase in the price level. So you know when we get out of this, uh, and that's still nothing like the seventies, and you know no double digits, no hyperinflation, but it's going to be something that is a lot more. And then, well, you don't want to be in cash and you don't want to be in bonds and you don't want to be in money assets and stocks are real assets. So, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, there's going to be bumps along the way, what I call paper tremors, but, uh, you know, uh, you know, there ain't no alternative uh, rains more now than it ever did before. Oh, man, people are going to hear you say that. And I was thinking, I wrote it down as you were talking, there is no alternative. I mean, that's what people say. What else are you going to yeah. do? What are you, what are you watching most of all right now? What, what concerns you the most? Or is it China slowing? Is it the Delta variant? Is it the Fed? And we're going to have some new reporting in a moment from Steve Leisman regarding that topic. But what, what, what are you watching most of all? Well, I watch the, you know, I mean, I watch the price indices because I think they're going to just be much worse coming up. I know we had a, a slightly benign one, uh, you know, relatively, uh, uh, you know, last week. But I think that honestly, the Fed's going to watch those price indices. And the next Fed meetings will be after the, uh, the August is reported. If that goes back up the way before, you're going to see a lot of things moving forward. Um, but then again, people are going to say, OK. So they're going to taper faster. Hey, maybe they're going to start raising in, in 2022. But still, you know, who, who's afraid of a 1% Fed funds rate when inflation's seven? I mean, I, I mean, you know, I want real assets. You know, I want land. I want property. I want real assets. Stocks are ultimate real assets in, in, in reality. And actually, stocks that are levered and have borrowed at the right now, fill up with as much borrowing as you can because you're just gonna be paying back with dollars that are worth a lot less. Um, and there's no trouble passing on these price and cost increases because there's more liquidity around than there ever has been before. Remember, the money supply in uh, you know last year increased by more than any other year in the last one and a half centuries, 150 years. M2 increase in the money supply. And that's got to be followed by inflation. It's can, never can you, not been followed by inflation. Can you see a scenario like Tom Lee paints? I'm sure you've seen his research, and I'm almost certain you've seen him on our air talking about it. This idea that, look, the Delta variant's peaking, earnings are picking up, and that's a scenario, and, and interest rates aren't going to be off to the races either. So yeah. even even with the Fed tapering a, a little sooner than maybe some expect, yeah. that everything can yeah. go you, up. You continue to go, yeah. And that's what I'm saying. First of all, you know, I mean, I I, I found that consumer confidence number to be um, rather anomalous because it's, it's it was very much different from the conference board number reported two weeks earlier. Um, I mean, to actually be below what we experienced last April is, is a little hard to believe. Um, uh, I actually think that there's a lot of discouragement because people see price increases. It's not just the Delta variant. I mean, I think that's going to crest through and not be a problem. I think a lot of people are saying, oh, my goodness, you know, inflation is going to be a lot worse than I thought. I thought I had a lot more money, but I'm paying that in prices. I don't have as much money. And, you, and, and if you take a look at the details of that report, it was in a lot of the purchase of durable goods that have gone up, autos and others. That's where the discouragement is. I don't think it's really the Delta uh, variant. I think that's going to pass. But uh, uh, I think that's where the discouragement is. But again, when you talk about investing alternatives, you know, uh, you know, worse inflation just argues less and less for fixed income and cash. You know what? I want you to stay with me. I want you to stay with me. Let's bring in Steve Leisman now, our senior economics reporter, who can shed some more light on when the Fed actually may act. You heard the professor, Steve. He's far from the only one. I, I'm, I'm betting that you think the Fed's a little behind the curve at this point. The fact of the matter is, it sounds like they may try and get ahead of it sooner than we think. Uh, I think the better way to say it, Scott, might be a little less behind. Uh, I think that's what they're aiming <laughs> okay. for here. Uh, look, the, uh, the, 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 Fed, the Fed was trying to be behind the curve. That was, their, that was their aim. That was their goal. They were trying to let inflation run and get the average inflation rate up to 2%. I think 
they uh, misunderestimated what would happen with supply shortages and really getting things going when you stuffed a lot of money in people's pockets and how much they would spend uh, relative to the supply and the supply shortages that were out there. But what we're hearing now, Scott, is that the uh, new potential uh, taper timeline has the Fed, in fact, announcing that taper in September. And you'll remember uh, our, our CNBC surveys a month ago had that in November or December. So that's pulling that forward by a couple months, mm -hmm. October or November for the actual taper to begin. Um, and you remember that was December or January 2023. And the length of the taper would be eight to 10 months, which would clear the way for possible rate hikes. And I think what the, the professor said is fascinating. Who's afraid of a 1% funds rate? If you think about what it would take for the Fed to get to a 1% funds rate, even if it began on day one of the 10th month of the taper ending or the eighth month, uh, you would not be at 1% until well into 2023. So if that's a glide path the professor requires for his investment, uh, it is well oiled. You know, Steve, I, it feels like the Fed's going to be successful in avoiding a taper tantrum because of a great taper telegraph. I mean, it's been no accident <laughs> that more speakers over the last two weeks have been more hawkish. It's like a concerted effort to get the market conditioned, as you reported, I don't know, a month ago, six weeks ago at this point, that they were going to do so that when they ultimately do the yeah. taper, everybody's cool. You know, Scott, that's an excellent observation on, on several fronts. The first is that very modest reaction to our reporting today. Um, very modest reaction last week. I think we hit all-time new highs while we were talking about a very uh, a significant contingent of the Federal Reserve moving towards um, uh, uh, a September taper announcement. Uh, and, and so, yes, the, the Powell has been successful at conditioning the market for that. But even more so, the more interesting thing is to look at the probabilities that have been out there and what's happened to the outlook for Fed rate hikes. Those have barely budged. And if Powell wanted to accomplish two things, he wanted to avoid a tantrum and he wanted to separate in the market's mind the criteria and the actions of tapering versus mm. changing interest rates. Mm -hmm. And it appears as if the market is kind of able to, you know, pat its head and rub its stomach at the same yeah. time when it comes to the difference between tapering and raising rates. Tapering is not tightening, right? And he was going to go to whatever right. lengths he, he had to go to to accomplish that goal or at least get the market to believe it. Steve, stay with me because I want to bring the professor back in. That's, what, that's why, Professor that we can talk about everything rallies in the same context of tapering and changing Fed policy, even albeit slightly. Yeah, yeah, I, absolutely. And, and you know, I mean, Steve laid it out and I mean, it's going to be eight to 10 months. And, and the tradition is you wait until taper is over to raise rates. You know, theoretically, now with the, uh, they could raise rates before ending the taper. Uh, because they uh, set the short-term rates on Fed funds rate by setting the interest rates on reserves, which could be independent. But uh, the tradition is you finish one before the other. Now, if the inflation numbers come in a lot worse than expected, you will see pressure to maybe start raising the rates before the taper actually ends. Um, again, I'm not scared about that because, you know, the quarter point increases uh, given, you know, the, the increase in profits and increase in inflation are still going to who's going to borrow and say, oh, my God, I, I'm not going to borrow against inventory costs that are rising at seven, eight, nine percent a year because suddenly, you know, the Fed has raised it to one or two percent. They say it's still free money for me. Yeah, yeah still uh -huh. free money for investors. Uh, so, again, uh, you know, the, the, the glide path for the bull market, uh, you know, I don't I, I don't see anything stopping it. All right. So, so, so Bryn, if, if we don't have to worry about the taper and we don't have to worry about China and we don't have to worry about Delta, what the heck do we have to worry about? Well, those are all good things to always worry about. But, you know, I have a question for Professor Siegel. You know, you talk a lot about inflation. And when I look at whether it's CPI or PCE, which we know the Fed looks at, but if you look at core CPI, I think about 40% is housing. And as a, as a lay person, you would think housing, that must be what is your house worth? But it's actually what's called owner equivalent rents, where they go out and ask people, what do you think you can rent your house for? And that number has been benign. 
But if you look at where apartment rentals are year to date, I think we're over 9% of an 9% up just this year when historically we have about 2 to 3%. So my question to you, are you looking at like the real inflation, like I'm explaining, like rentals? And do you think that our policymakers are somewhat ignoring the real inflation versus something like an owner equivalent rent, which just is not a real number that we yes. all live and breathe as, as homeowners? Well, you, you are, you just hit a bullseye. You're, you're absolutely on target. I, I've been speaking about this. You take a look at housing and owners uh, equivalent rent and they're up like two, two and a half, three percent from a year ago. And you say, just a minute here. The average price of a home is up 20 to 25 percent. And as you mentioned, the data on rentals, uh, I mean, uh, are, are soaring. Um, it's the way the Bureau of Labor Statistics computes it. They are so lagged. Every six months, they ask the question, well, you know, on your lease, are you up? So the, all this inflation is going to just come in over the next 12 to 18 months. Um, and it's, 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 they're going to be 20% inflate. You're right. Housing is 35 to 40% of the total, actually 30%, I think, of the CPI and 40% of the core, as you mentioned. That's slowly going to go up to a 20% increase. Uh, and it's only at a 2.5% increase today. So you're absolutely right. Um, there's more and more reports coming out on that. I don't know why the staff and the, the meetings say, guys, I, I think we have a ticking time bomb here for the reports, but it's already happened, but you're not going to get good data for the next six to 12 months. Hey, hey Steve, hey, Steve Leisman, before I let you, you bounce, because I want to get back to the, the committee and, and some specific stock related stuff. Um, the impact of China slowing the Delta variant and the unknown and the timing of September is that problematic for what some in the Fed a week or two thought was going to be a, a worthy timeline? I think it could be. Let me quickly respond to what the professor was saying, which is that um, the, the Fed is recognizing some of this concern about inflation that it could linger beyond. Remember, this was going to be something that was going to be transitory through the fall then transitory through the end of the year. And now I think there's a sense at the Fed that this inflation problem is indeed going to linger into next year. And that's a reason why there's a, a, a little bit more urgency about the taper at the Federal Reserve. All those things are, are wild card, Scott, that you mentioned. Um, I think uh, uh, Fed Chair Powell doesn't think that the Delta variant is going to be a huge deal economically. Obviously, he's concerned about what's going on with people's lives. But economically, I think the issue is that uh, uh, he um, uh, doesn't see, he believes that we've learned to live with this um, uh, uh, disease and that ultimately demand will not suffer. Supply remains an issue, and that's really an inflation problem. He's sticking to transitory, whether it's the Delta variant or inflation. We'll see. Steve, thanks, as always. That's Steve Leisman. Professor, sure. it's always good to hear from you. Uh, I'm sure Bryn appreciates the A-plus that you gave her for her question to <laughs> you as well. We'll talk to you again soon. That's, <laughs> that's Professor Jeremy Siegel at the Wharton School down in Pennsylvania for us. Up next, I mentioned the plethora of moves that our committee members are making today. you got to hear about some of these. We're going to do that next. And as a reminder, you can always watch or listen to us live on the go on the CNBC app. We're back. Two minutes.